Cardiovascular disease strikes in every nation around the world. From sudden cardiac arrest to the disabling effects of ACS and stroke, cardiovascular disease remains a leading cause of death and disability in many parts of the world. Understanding and activating the systems of care developed by the American Heart Association can help improve survival rates and may even prevent cardiac arrest. You play a pivotal role in providing high quality cardiovascular care. What you do matters. What you learn can save lives. In this science overview video, you'll be presented with the most recent recommendations on cardiovascular care based on the latest scientific studies. In the next few minutes, we'll outline the changes in the 2010 American Heart Association guidelines for emergency cardiovascular care and continue to emphasize some of the core recommendations from the 2005 guidelines. These guidelines were produced after an exhaustive review of thousands of peer-reviewed publications. We'll approach these changes systematically by first reviewing changes to basic life support or BLS guidelines the steps in the BLS survey for healthcare providers have changed. Instead of the familiar steps of A, B, C, D, where clearing the airway and breathing come before chest compressions, chest compressions now take priority for the unresponsive arrest patient. The guidelines now recommend delivering chest compressions first, before clearing the airway and giving ventilations. The American Heart Association removed look, listen, and feel for breathing and giving two rescue breaths from the initial assessment entirely. So the BLS survey now includes these four steps. Step one, check for responsiveness. Tap and shout, are you all right? And scan the chest for movement. Step two, activate the emergency response system and get an AED. Step three, circulation. Check the carotid pulse. If you find a pulse, support the patient with rescue breathing once every five to six seconds. If you cannot feel a pulse within 10 seconds, initiate CPR by giving 30 chest compressions followed by two ventilations. Do not spend more than 10 seconds checking for a pulse. Step four, defibrillation. As soon as possible, connect an AED or defibrillator and if indicated, deliver a shock. Why was it necessary to change these familiar steps? The majority of adult sudden cardiac arrest patients have VF or pulseless VT rhythm. The heart is quivering, but not effectively pumping blood to vital organs. These patients have a much higher survival rate if they receive immediate chest compressions and early defibrillations. The ABCD sequence often delayed chest compressions. By changing the sequence and giving chest compressions first, more patients may achieve return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC. However, there are cases where healthcare providers should tailor the sequence of rescue actions to fit the most likely cause of arrest. For example, in the case of a drowning victim or other instances where hypoxia is the likely cause of the cardiac arrest, the priority would be to provide rescue breathing. High quality chest compressions were emphasized in the 2005 guidelines. The American Heart Association continues to place a strong emphasis on high quality CPR. This is indicated by a rate of at least 100 chest compressions per minute, a compression depth of at least two inches in adults, allowing complete chest recoil after each compression, switching rescuers every two minutes, minimizing interruptions in compressions, and avoiding hyperventilation. The recommendations continue in the new guidelines because scientific studies continue to link high quality CPR to ROSC. High quality chest compressions maintain blood flow to vital organs, especially the heart and brain. One way to measure the effectiveness of chest compressions is with coronary perfusion pressure. Coronary perfusion pressure is the difference between the pressure in the aorta at the end of ventricular relaxation or the aortic end diastolic pressure and the pressure in the right atrium or the right atrial end diastolic pressure at the same time. The higher the coronary perfusion pressure during CPR, the better the survival rate for the patients. As chest compressions begin, it takes several compressions to raise the coronary perfusion pressure to a level adequate to supply blood to the brain and heart. When rescuers interrupt chest compressions, perfusion pressure falls dramatically and remains very low until they resume compressions. 
Since coronary perfusion pressure measurements are not readily available during a resuscitation attempt, rescuers can monitor CPR quality with waveform capnography and intraarterial relaxation pressure. Let's take a look at how the BLS steps come together in an arrest situation with an unconscious patient. Here's our case scenario. A 57-year-old man is experiencing many of the warning signs of acute coronary syndromes with chest discomfort, indigestion, and feeling faint. He collapses and falls to the floor. Sir? Sir, can you hear me? Look or scan the chest for movement. He's unresponsive. Call a code and get the AED and crash cart now. The code team is on the way. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. Apply pads to patient's bare chest. Plug in pads connector. Analyzing heart okay, rhythm. Stand back. Stay clear of patient. Seven, shock advised. Charging. Stay I'm ready clear to shock. of patient. I'm clear. Deliver You're clear. Now. We're all clear. Press the shock button now. Begin with compression. One, two, three, four, five. In the five decades since chest compressions were first attempted on a cardiac arrest patient, there have been significant improvements in the treatment of acute cardiovascular disease there is much more work to be done. With the latest research pointing to new quantifiable ways to improve patient outcomes, advanced providers have more tools than ever before to reduce death and disability caused by cardiovascular diseases and stroke.